The following program is made possible by the faithful friends and supporters of Higher Aim. Well, welcome. I'm glad you have joined us again. We are walking through the life of David. And one of the things that we're going to see in his life today is that David trusted God with the plan of his life. Maybe that's where you are. You're trying to sort out your plan that needs to be God's plan. Stick with us. You're going to be glad you did. Allow me to read this passage to you, and then we will take the next step in the life of King David. Why don't you follow along with me? There in Acts 13, 22. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, from that, we realize that there is a picture of a man, a woman, who is after God's own heart. And I know that if you're tuned in today, mentally, physically, spiritually, that you are trying to position yourself to hear from God. And that's very, very important. And it says a lot about your character and your longing to be an individual after God's own heart. Now, what does it look like to be a man after God's own heart? What I want to share with you is that the person who is after God's own heart will trust their life to God's plan. So here it is. You need to trust your life to God's plan. And just like King David, your life is different. Well, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about his life. Do you realize that most commentators believe that he was anointed king over Israel somewhere between the ages of 10 and 15? So he was a teenager, a young teenager. But do you understand that it would be till, it would not be until he was about 30 years of age that he would become the king over United Israel? Do you realize his life kind of went like that? That is something that you and I can identify with. I don't know about you, but my life hasn't been a straight shot. Uh, my life has been kind of a, a different turn here and there. Maybe yours has too. You know, professionally, I, I got to tell you, I, I grew up in Texas. Maybe I hear the twang every once in a while. Uh, and then God had placed on my heart uh, a, a desire while I was in seminary to be a church planter. But I wanted to plant a church outside the Bible Belt, but, but God did not allow me to do that when I was fresh out of seminary. Instead, I, I went to West Texas and pastored in a town where there were more animals than there were people. You know, I got to know the ranchers, and that's where my ministry was, and then God led me to another town several years later, uh, a town that had sent volunteers to the Battle of of uh, the Alamo in Texas, and God allowed me to be pastor there, and the church grew dramatically, uh, about doubled in attendance. And then I went to a church in Houston that was half the size of the church where I was pastoring. But we knew inside our hearts that God wanted us to go there, and the church exploded in, in just unbelievable growth. And that was a, a wonderful experience. And then we we uh, ended up following God's lead, and at the right time, at the right place, he invited us to leave it all and go to Colorado and plant churches. And the church I planted originally in Colorado, in Pueblo, Colorado, is one of the largest churches in the state today. And I got to tell you, uh, our church got a ch had the chance to plant several other churches, and that was exciting. And then, of all things, God would lead me to Florida to pastor for about five years there on the Space Coast. And then something really strange happened. <laughs> God led me to Nebraska. I <laughs> but let me, let me tell you something. I, I had never been to Nebraska. 
Nebraska was not on my radar. In fact, I knew that, that the U.S. had a state called Nebraska, but I had never been here. And can I be really honest with you? I had never prayed, oh, Lord, don't let me die until you let me go to Nebraska just once. I, I didn't do that. You see, my life hasn't always gone the, the regular route. In fact, I had a guy uh, in, in a church that I pastored in the South years ago who came up to me, he was one of the leaders in our church, and said this to me. He said, I think that you have been born with a silver spoon in your mouth. I said, why, why would you say that? He said, well, uh, it seems like you get everything you want and you're always so confident. I said, you don't know a thing about me. If you think I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, uh, and he looked at me and said, yeah, you probably came from a real wealthy family. I went, what? <laughs> I had to look at him and go, you're clueless. And he said, then why are you like what you are? I said, well, let me just tell you, it's Jesus. If there's anything good that comes out of me, it's Jesus. And that's where the confidence comes from. That's where the assurance comes from. It's not where I've been or in the pattern I've been. Many of us who are here in this place, our lives have gone just like that. And even though God may have given us a glimpse of where, what he had for us, we, we look at our lives and, and we don't see too many straight lines. It seems like we're just kind of going here and going there, and I've often described my life, and maybe you can relate to this, like a pinball machine. And in a pinball game, you usually pull back a, a lever and it's spring-loaded, and it shoots a, a little round steel ball, and it goes up and it bounces off to the side, and if it's really a highly technical thing, bells and whistles will go off, and there are some bumpers that are used to kick that ball back into play. And eventually, if the angles don't work out, the ball finally comes back and goes to home and lines back up to be shot out again. I look at my life and I look at the path of my life and feel like I've been more a pinball that has been shot out in different angles, different places, different direction but with one goal, and that's to score as many points as possible. And maybe that's what, what you look at your life being. Well, you have a lot in common with King David because what he did was to trust his life to God's plan. And sometimes the plans for our lives don't look like anybody else's. In fact, all the time, our lives are not going to look like anybody else's. You have no idea of what many of the people in this church right now and are watching by, online or by television, you have no idea where their lives have gone. But I bet you that the overwhelming majority of us probably feel like pinballs. You think David felt like that? I mean, once he was anointed as a young man, a teenager, then having the blessing and confidence to stand and bring down Goliath and wealth came, popularity. He was in line uh, for the palace to become a friend of the king, and then it all went south pretty quickly. And all of a sudden, this man who had so much promise was now on the run from the man who was his father-in-law, who was extremely jealous of him. Maybe your life has been like that. Maybe you've had one success, and then you maybe have had another success, but then something happened and the rug got pulled out from underneath you. Don't feel for a moment that somehow or another that you're out of God's will. In fact, the curvature of your life or the trajectory of your life and the direction and even the angle of it all could be God's orchestration to put you in the right place at the right time. So you need to remember a couple of things. Being second sometimes is a blessing. You don't always have to be first, the first trailblazer. You see, being, a, being second 
can do several things in your life. Number one, it can pave the path for you. It, you won't have to endure as much change if you're second, just like David was the second king, uh, as well as he can learn positively from the negative things that Saul did. He could glean that. As well as when there is a path that has already been paved for you, you can take a step back and you can see much further than you could than when you first had to knock down trees in the jungle. There's some positive things, and you need to trust that God can use the lessons in your life and through your life for His glory. Remember, there is nothing that you go through that God can't use. In fact, the Bible tells us, and you need to put this as a reference, there in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29, that God uses all of the stuff we've gone through to knock off edges that don't look like Jesus in our lives. That's what he's trying to do, to conform us to the image of his son. And so therefore, your life is not going to go the direction everybody else is. You are completely unique. You are so unique. And you and I don't need to compare ourselves to each other. Uh, don't feel like you're behind or you're ahead. You're just on the journey. And so therefore, you've got to, like David, learn to trust your life to God's plan. There's another thing I would tell you, that, that when you are trusting your life to God's plan, you need to remember that your faith, when it's in God, will allow you to conquer giants. And sometimes those exits that God invites you to take are departures from the main road in your life will teach you how to learn to trust God so that you can become a giant killer. You see, God was preparing David to be king, and he needed to learn through experience that God could be trusted against some of the most impossible odds and situations. And that's what God does in the journey in our lives to teach us what it means to trust Him. And so that's why it's critical that as a child of God who wants to be after God's own heart, you will trust your life to God's plan. But you also need to get this key thought in your mind. You don't have to force your way. You see, if you're trusting your life to God's plan, you don't have to force your way. You don't have to manipulate. You, you do not have to orchestrate. You don't have to administrate. You don't have to be trying to make things happen. As a child of God, things are going to happen in your life, but you don't have to force your way. I told you that David was on the run specifically from Saul for four years in his life, and he had ample opportunities to kill Saul and take over kingship. But not one time did David find himself even tempted, except when he was in a, a little cave and cut off the edge of Saul's garment but he even felt remorse over doing that there in En Gedi, and he would not touch Saul. He didn't make it happen. Though he could have, he chose not to. You know why? Because he was trusting God's plan for his life. And if God took him to kingship, it would be because God took him to kingship. But if God allowed him to live, on the back 40 for some time for the rest of his life, that was going to be good enough for David. And you and I, we've got to come to that place in our lives where we stop forcing our way. Many of us who are uh, involved in business, uh, we think, well, you need to say the right thing to the right people and smile at the right people and, and, uh, and do those things, be the yes man to the people who want you to be the yes man and, and, and be bold and say what you think when you learn. What, stop trying to manipulate things. As a child of God, God's hand is upon you and your life, and there is not anything that you will walk through that God cannot use for His glory. And that's why you need to trust your life 
to God's plan. You want to be a man, a woman after God's own heart? Stop trying to control your life and start leaning back and leaning in to Jesus because only in Him, only in Him will that make a difference. So let me just take you another step with this. You need to remember several things. When you walk through your life, there's going to be pain. There is going to be pain. I wish I could tell you, you give your life to Christ, you fall in love with Jesus, it will be easy street. And you'll never have any problems. You'll never have any financial problems. Just love Jesus and tithe. <laughs> and you will always have enough money to do everything and then some. Cancun will be your second home. I wish I could tell you that, but that's not the truth. I wish I could tell you that you fall in love with Jesus, he's going to give you the best-looking spouse that, that any magazine could ever capture the photo. I'm sorry to tell you, I'm already taken. <laughs> and that whoever you marry, oh, they're going to always be so wonderful to you in your life. They're going to be a blessing to you in your life. They're going to always encourage you, always be there for you, always believe in you, will bow before you and say, what can I do for you next? <laughs> now, if you want to think that, you go ahead. But sometimes in relationships, there's some pain. Can I get an amen on relationship pain? And even if you know Jesus and your spouse knows Jesus because you both are in skin suits, those skin suits sometimes get the better of us. It creates all kinds of pain. Wish I could tell you that you follow Jesus, your kids are going to always be obedient. They're going to always be kind to each other and respectful of you, and uh, they're going to be perfect. I wish I could tell you that, but I can't tell you that. I wish I could tell you that you'll never have any physical problems your hair will never turn white. <laughs> You'll never have to deal with cancer. You'll never have heart disease. And you'll hear one miracle after another miracle in your life physically because you're a follower of Jesus. Let me tell you something. That's not real. We're not made to live here forever. And one of the great things that you and I can do is understand this key thing. Remember that your pain is never wasted. Let me say it again. Your pain is never wasted. Everything that you have gone through, everything that you're going through right now is preparing you for the days to come. I already gave you a glimpse that God's knocking off those edges that don't look like Jesus in your life. That pain is often a great chisel that God uses, but you need to understand that God never waste your pain because it'll do a couple of things. Number one, it's going to point you to God because when you go through personal pain like David did, you're going to start looking upward because when you've been looking outward to other people, the, the support that you wanted didn't come. And it's going to force you to say, God, help, whether it's physical or financial or relational. And David had all of those challenges, and you and I will too. They will point you to God. That's what pain does. It's, it's never wasted. It will also pave your next steps. If you want to know the next direction in your life, look back at your pain. Analyze your pain. Because sometimes God uses your pain to be pavement along the journey that you can step on to take the next step. You see, God wants to use your personal pain in order to do something else. He wants to use it to provide encouragement to others. Now watch this. Of the somewhere over 70 Psalms that David is considered author of in the book of Psalms, most of them are coming out of his pain, his fear, his frustration, his disillusionment. 
his brokenness, his confession, his repentance. You realize that? And what is happening in David's life as he is trusting God for the plan of his life, all of a sudden when he is squeezed, words come out to where thousands of years later we are still leaning and trusting the wisdom of the words that he wrote out of his pain. And one, one of the things that you find is that David expresses frustration, but at the very end of the psalm, he's always saying, but God, I know you'll come through. You see, you know why he said that? Because he was able to trust his life to God. And he trusted the plan of his life to the Father. And that's why he was a man after God's own heart. Some of you have gone through a lot of pain in your life. I know it. Some of you are going through a lot of pain in your life right now. I know that too. Don't think for a moment that any of that will be wasted. I think I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, or maybe even last time we were together, that some of us in this church family have gone through divorce. I know what that feels like. I was a child of a broken home, and I know the pain that my mom went through, and I know the pain that, and the confusion that our family went through, and I, I don't like divorce. But I realize that um, people make mistakes, and life happens, doesn't it? But sometimes the brokenness that follows decisions in our life, God uses to shape us to be what he wants us to be for the days to come. That's why we always need to be a church of real grace. You know why? If we're not a church of grace, we will be operating under a false assumption that God only uses perfect people. And if we operate under that presupposition, I don't need to be your pastor. Again, when I point one finger at you, I got three pointing back at me. Let me just tell you, any brokenness or any pain in your life, God can redeem and use for his glory. And so that's why you must never discount yourself. And regardless of the path that your life may go, with decisions that you have made, whether good or bad, that has resulted in personal pain in your life, you must come to the place to where you're trusting God for the outcome. And if you do, you'll be an individual who is after God's own heart. And that will produce a sense of dependence upon him to where you are trusting him with everything in your life and through every season in your life and not just when things are going great because sometimes they don't and you need a theology and an understanding of who God is for all seasons of your life and not just the good ones. David had all seasons too and the reason why he is listed as one who was after God's own heart because, well, he trusted his life to God's plan. So are you? Are you trusting your life to God's plan? I don't know where you're headed, don't know where you're going. I don't know where a lot of us have been. But I am here to tell you that regardless of where you are on that continuum, the journey is not the arrival at a particular point. It's the process in between. That's where you grow. That's where ministry happens. That's where God will use your life for his glory. And your life will be used for his glory if you first know Christ as Lord of your life. Have there, has there come a moment where you turned from sin and placed your faith in Christ? Has there been a, a moment where you threw yourself helplessly, hopelessly upon the mercy of God and received what Jesus did for you on the cross by shedding his perfect, innocent blood for you? 
to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, all your sin? Have you thrown yourself helplessly, hopelessly upon God's mercy? If not, that's the first thing you need to do. And if indeed you've already done that, as a child of God, stay there. Stay there to the place where you push into that relationship with Christ and you focus in on intimacy with Him. Even when you can't see clearly the next step, you don't have to see the next step. You just need to see His eyes and feel His heart and trust His Word. That's when you're on solid ground and He will use all of you for His glory. In just a moment, Dr. Dodd will return with a closing thought. Where is God when I hurt? Is He there? Does He care? Do you wonder why it seems that when you hurt, you're all alone? This month on Higher Aim, we're offering a message by Dr. Dodd entitled, Where is God when I hurt? This complete unedited message will give you a biblical perspective on hurting and how to get relief. To receive your free audio CD of Where Is God When I Hurt, call or go online today. Thank you for staying with us to the very end of this program, because what I want to share with you right now is really a question. What's going on in your life? Where are you on accomplishing God's plan for your life? Are you leaning back? and trusting His plan, or are you fighting it? You know, it's difficult because sometimes we want to, in our prayers, force God to do what we want to do. And sometimes, well, it just doesn't work out that way. Maybe you're going through something right now that uh, you're wondering, Lord, why am I right here, right now? Well, there's someone who is standing by right now. One of our ministry partners would consider it an honor to pray with you and visit with you. Call us. The number is on the screen. We want to help you sort it out and pray for you. And most of all, if you don't know Christ, show you how to encounter a brand new life. Call us, we are waiting for you. And if you have met Christ and you need encouragement and you just need somebody with skin on to pray for you, call us. God bless you for walking with us through the life of King David. Thank you for joining us on Higher Aim. Have you been encouraged by what you've heard today? We would love to hear from you. Call 1-800-491-4400, visit us at higheraim.org, or write to us at Higher Aim, Post Office Box 8100, Omaha, Nebraska 68108. Thank you again for joining us. See you next time on Higher Aim. The preceding program was brought to you by the faithful supporters of Higher Aims.